Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you to State of Europe, our virtual online festival of politics and ideas. Those of you who are joining us again from yesterday, welcome back. It's day two, where we focus on trade, um, markets and geopolitics. The whole day is all about that. What does sovereignty actually mean? Uh, and what does, you know, what does that geopolitical autonomy also mean? What do we do about industrial strategy and innovation? My name is Damendra Kanani. I'm very pleased to welcome you all. Those of you who are joining us for the first day, first time, welcome. Um, I hope you have a good time with us. Um, make sure that you connect on the platform by, make, uh, by ensuring that you're able to see what's what we've got on offer today. Um, we have a number of formats um, on, on offer for you uh, throughout this week. And one of them is, uh, is an idea sharing uh, a moment, uh, a session where we spend 15 minutes where we get an expert, someone who's doing something interesting, thoughtful, innovative, that can share with you um, ideas for framing conversations throughout today, but also through the week. Um, those of you who are aware, we know there's a, uh, a very quiet bio-revolution taking place that has the potential for transforming societies and economies. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to invite Ma Matthias Evers, who is a senior partner at McKinsey, to share some of the thinking and work they have been doing um, in um, this area and to set out what the potential is, both for framing the EU's future economic uh, pathway, but what it means also more widely in terms of the issues around trade, innovation, research. Matthias, it gives me a great pleasure to invite you to join us. Before you say a few words, I want to share with you the results um, of our citizens' poll. We've annually conducted for the past few years a, view, a, 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 a survey of citizens, and one uh, a, a result, if you like, that speaks to this agenda is, as you can see, all of you, I hope you can see on screen, is that just over, just a third of Europeans want to prioritize technology, science, and research, making it a mid-ranking priority. Because we ask, we ask citizens, as you can see, over 10,500, you know, what should the priorities be of the EU over the next five years? And you can see where people are on this particular one. Yet, those of you uh, are aware, in terms of economics and uh, economic development and growth, it's those countries that invest in innovation that do the best in the long term. However, over to you, Matthias, to share your thoughts on the bio-revolution. What does it mean for us in terms of economics and society? Thank you very much and a warm welcome to you. Thank you very much, Damendra. Really, really appreciate the kind introduction and the kind words. And, and I really look forward to this presentation and this honor of giving it. Let me share uh, a couple of slides in the background as I introduce to you uh, mm, the bio-revolution. Somebody might ask the bio-revolution, why now? And this is a timely moment as a chemistry Nobel as a Nobel Prize in chemistry was awarded to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Duda. But I promise you, this, uh, this question we asked one year ago. So this is one year of research that I tried to condense in, in 10 minutes. Okay. We see massive progress on the biology side. Um, and CRISPR is only one aspect of it. Somebody might call CRISPR the word processor to edit our genes. There's also Google Maps of our genes, a human cell atlas project to really understand all our cells. So the very simple message is here, we see massive progress in biology that feels very different than the year 2000 because there have been some people who said this biorevolution started in the year 2000 when the ju uh, human genome sequence was available, a project worth 5 billion. But now we see suddenly CRISPR, uh, understanding of signaling processes, etc. So real move in terms of understanding biology. That comes in confluence with progress on computing, automation, and AI. And that makes this moment special. To give you uh, maybe one or two examples, people in the lab who work in biology always felt biology is very messy. This picture shows you something which is very not messy. It's robotics, how we actually at fast speed, at rapid scale, understand biological data. One example is the, the, the cost of data storage. 
In the year 2000, it would have costed what to store one genome roughly $20. Now it costs a fraction of a cent. So these are innovation factors of 5,000 fold, 10,000 fold. Or we can suddenly screen cells in automated robots that give us scale and better understanding of data. Now, we ask the question, does this confluence of better understanding biology, all these innovations like CRISPR, and the confluence with progress on automation AI generate a biorevolution? As we came out with this research, I mean, I think you know our answer. Our answer is yes, and this is a special moment of time and an opportunity as introduced that will impact how we live, our societies and economies. Let us introduce the, the idea a little bit better. What are we talking about in terms of areas of science? Because there's a lot of confusion and breadth of concepts. We structure this into four areas. First, the biomolecules. Here we talk about, let's say, our, our DNA, our genetic makeup, and how we modify it. So we see progress of gene therapies. However, there are also novel biomaterials of better, uh, bet, uh, better features, even than chemical produced molecules. Then, interesting enough, there's the biosystems. So that could mean how do we uh, generate new organs to, ge uh, to respond to a medical need? This can mean, mean we produce cultured meat, so to replace food, animal produced food. There are also the areas of biomachine interfaces and biocomputing. So neuroprosthetics, again, out of the medical field, or biocomputing. And I give you this one example. One kilogram of DNA, so of the human genes, could hold the information of the current world, the total information of the world, one kilogram. Again, I'm not proposing here that biocomputing will replace uh, silicon-based computing as we know it. I'm just saying there is progress in many dimensions and there are many use cases we even don't fully understand. But this gives you a map of how to understand the bio biology revolution. If there are two or three things to take away, this is one of them. Because if you speak about the biorevolution, somebody will say, oh, I'm talking biotech in pharma. Mm. Oh, I'm talking biotech in agro. But here's something more at play. We, we see emergence of five capabilities that really cut across industries. So for instance, um, number one, we have the biology means to produce materials of better performance of sustainability. So we can, for instance, modify cells to produce new materials that can replace how we produce materials uh, based on chemical processes. Or number two, we can much more precisely target actions. Imagine in the morning we take on our cream, so some of us might take a cream, but that's really targeted to your genetic makeup and has, a, uh, has certain performance and certain features that you as, an, as a customer really like. So in short, there are five cross-cutting um, capabilities. And of course, does this have some impact, this bio-revolution? I, I will spare you the detailed economic assessment that leads you to um, um, value of two to four trillion dollars direct impact. Let me say this again: two to four trillion dollars direct impact. And then we have. On what? Uh, uh, if I can stop you, so Matthias, on on what time scale? When you think this about that value. Scale. Yeah, it's it's a very good question, and and I should clarify that. Mm. So we looked. Let me actually back up. We looked at the visible innovation pipeline. So what are bio-based products already on the market? and in the visible pipeline. To reach full adoption, we looked at the horizon of 2020 to 2030, and then also 2030 to 2040. So to reach the four, four trillion, we look over the next 20 years. Okay. But the important comment here is that the visible pipeline. So this, this is not yet uh, combining these capabilities to, to the, uh, towards new use cases. This is just what we see already and creating adoption. And to illustrate what do four to, uh, two to four trillion really mean, it's, it's, I, I would propose to rem remember these four numbers here on this slide. And as you see, they are really in response to the big human, uh, human challenges we have on this planet. In the upper left-hand corner, we can replace 60% of our direct physical inputs. So what does it mean? Chemical products can re be re uh, produced by biological means 
So this could lead to products of better features or produced in a more sustainable way. We can respond to the unmet medical need. So the cancers, the, the mental disease, I mean, the real killers of this world. And our bottom up model suggests we can uh, reduce it by 45% with these visible innovations. We can accelerate R&D by biological means. And what was maybe the most surprising and energizing figure, the seven to nine percent, how all these biotechnologies can contribute to sustainability and reduce man-made global greenhouse emissions. That's really the imp impact potential of the biorevolution. Now, it's very important we talk about potential, but we have to talk about the risk as well, because this also drives how we have to think about actually delivering it and, and collaborating around the biorevolution. Here you see um, six elements. I won't talk about everyone in detail, but I think there are two, three themes hidden. Mm. On the one hand, we have across the world different value systems. We have imbalances, and we have also different views on privacy concerns, because when we look into the medical field, we look at the most private data almost, our genetic makeup, how we are made as a body. And it's really a, a, a judgment. How do we use this data? How do we as individuals donate this data? What are the standards? How do we protect it, etc.? That's perhaps one broad theme. There's a second broad theme. And I have to say, so far, I didn't talk about the COVID and the pandemic around us, because this research started really before. But it shows us biology does not res uh, respect jurisdictional boundaries. So I'm not talking about malicious intent for the moment. But if, let's say, like the IT companies in the 80s, you start in a garage because some of the biotechnology you just buy on the internet legally, and you start experimenting, and you just create something that is replicating. So there's certain risk and certain boundaries have to be set, given how interconnected biology is. So what I'm proposing here is, to actually recognize what you mentioned as a silent revolution, mm -hmm. as something of major impact potential, but also of very specific risk. And that leads me already to concluding here in terms of a couple of statements for innovators, for businesses, for policymakers. And let me go step by step here. Number one is we believe it's time that this biorevolution allows us to, uh, to generate biology first business models. These are business models which are, go beyond industries, create enablers, create new capabilities, let's say screening of cells as a basis for new materials of very broad impact. Secondly, we believe here is something that can drive a much more personalized impact, be it in consumer industries, be it in medical, be it in, in, in the chemicals industries, and material-based industries, etc. So thirdly, almost like digital, this has the potential to disrupt the value chains. Mm. So we are better well ahead what's happening here. So yes, everybody talks about the digital disruption, but let's also consider the confluence with biology and what it means. I'm very excited about number four, the confluence of disciplines, because this means collaboration, collaboration across experts. And in fact, uh, Professor Dudna, I mean, who I mentioned before, as we worked, I mean, she also contributed to this, and there was a comment on what to study these days to mm. really embrace it. And that was interesting enough more raised on the computing AI analytics side, because we need that collaboration with biology. And lastly, across so social and regulatory as a side, I think again, how regulatory acts here, how the private public interface looks like and how we collaborate. So bottom line, yes, we believe there is a biology revolution. Yes, we believe it has significant impact, but also a specific risk profile. And we want to make people aware, almost as aware of the digital revolution, mm. because this will have impact for all of us. With that, I thank you for allowing us to, to raise this idea here today. Matthias, thank you very much. And you know, one of the things that occurs to me, and I'm glad you went to that slide about the risks, because everything you were describing kept on ringing alarm bells. When we think about our historical, our experience in, in history uh, around dodgy innovation, if I can call it that, <coughs> we there's an element that this could be um, seeding all manner of stuff that's going to clash with our values, our ethics, our morality. And there's something about how the biorevolution, in particular CRISPR and other ma matters, which can be hugely impactful, but also hugely yeah. malicious. 
And um, when we think about, you know, synthetic babies and uh, when we think about what might happen to our bodies and what we can do, but also what we are saying about issues around disability, um, race potentially. There's all manner of stuff that could come up. So there's something here about having some form of a governance and regulatory framework on the one hand, whilst seeding what, as you quite rightly say, when you think of the benefits, it's VAR, are there VARs? Because if we learn the lessons from the digital revolution, we might have thought differently about how young people are accessing all manner of stuff well before they're mature and what, what it's doing to social relations and, and human relations more broadly. And there's something similar about learning from this tipping point in the revolution. But if I can ask you just very briefly, Matthias, where does Europe stand on this? What's it, is this, is this ha does this have potential to be Europe's competitive advantage? Or is it missing, it, or is it missing the point? Are you getting you know, doors open to saying, this is a really important thing to do? I mean, I really appreciate your comments and thank you for also uh, picking on this. I mean, as you can tell, I'm a scientist by background. I'm excited about the potential, but this is, I mean, this is why this work was explicitly also focused on the risk because it's, it's a side of the opportunity and the risk. And that's why um, I think also I raise it as an idea here in the context of Friends of Europe, because really understanding it, providing that framework could be a strength of Europe. And let me more specifically talk about Europe. Number one, I believe Europe is one of the leading regions in terms of the foundation of science. Mm. The strength of science sits here and actually across the disciplines because collaboration is a big element here. And we could easily see in with our scientific diversity, cultural diversity, that this foundation is even further strengthened. So the basis is here. However, I think, I mean, and I published separately on, on this, actually, the scaling in Europe is, is missing. How do mm -hmm. we translate the scientific foundation into new business models and that scaling? That's a call out I would do. And actually being alerted, here's the next revolution coming. So over the next 20 years to be really on the forefront, as we have seen, we are not necessarily on the digital side. So mm -hmm. I see here again, massive opportunity, but almost a watch out how to leverage the strengths of Europe. Hopefully that triggers us for further discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, Matthias, for that. And you know, it's, it's, it is something that was ever thus. Europe's excellent at innovation and research and development, but our history shows us, at least in the past 25 years, it's others that take it to scale globally. And I suppose there's, some, there's a lesson to be learned here is how can we capture this moment as you describe it? Uh, and this idea, actually, that has vast uh, potential human benefit and doing something with it that can actually be transformative, but actually to be ahead of the game and scale it rather than wait for others to actually do it for us. Matthias, thank you for sharing your idea, but also that, that very rich information base and it done in a, such a simple and clear way. I know that people who want to um, access that can go to the McKinsey website, but also we'll have the slides on ours as well um, and on the hashtag uh, State of U EU, um, uh, State of uh, Europe. Uh, platform for it to be shared with you. So thank you very much for that um, and much appreciated. And I hope you can continue to join us for the rest of today uh, or parts of today. Um, colleagues, um, a very warm welcome to you who are now joining us for the first session. So that was the idea sharing so a moment, but now we are moving into uh, one of our bigger high level sessions uh, devoted, as I said today, devoted to trade, geopolitics and competition and other matters. Uh, today, we're talking about reshaping the EU's industrial strategy from competition to trade policy. Um, before I introduce speakers and say a few words of introduction, let me just kind of uh, set out the rules of the game here in terms of engagement. Um, a very warm welcome to those of you who are on Zoom, but also a warm welcome to those of you who are watching live stream. Um, those on Zoom should know you should have your video on, make sure your name's there and keep yourself muted um, until obviously I invite you to say something. Um, if you want to ask a question, raise a point or just share your frustration, do that using your virtual hand. Those of you who don't know where it is, look at the participants um, uh, um, motto, motto or logo on your screen, press on that and you'll find the virtual hand. Those of you who are on live stream, uh, warm welcome again. Use hashtag State of EU to 
post your comments, raise your questions and your ideas, uh, or, or even frustrations about the process or whatever. Uh, we, w we wish your engagement. So thank you to, to all of you for joining. And those are the kind of process points. We have uh, uh, just over an, uh, just an hour to get through a very chunky topic. We have a, a range of really high quality contributors to, the, to join the other discussants in this Zoom forum to deliberate what it is to uh, reshape or transform industrial policy and strategy in the future. So we have, um, as, I, as I said, a, a rich set of contributors uh, for this discussion, but just a couple of words of, uh, or thoughts on framing some of this. Uh, we know that uh, the single market, the EU single market, and, and the actual economic base weight of it is the largest in the world. Uh, it's the fourth tra largest trading bloc, but the econ economic impact um, is of some uh, 15 trillion euros. We also know, we also know that um, the bulwark of the EU is small to medium enterprises. 90 percent, 90 percent of, of uh, you know, companies are small to medium enterprises. And we basically have a, a huge uh, relationship with our neighbours and our global partners in terms of uh, import imports. Um, we need to be thinking long and hard about how we've used our trade agreements um, in, in the world and what we think about those in the future. What we all know, and you know, is that the uh, COVID crisis has not just left field. And we know that the, econ you know, the world's economic output is going to shrink phenomenally by the end of this year. And, you know, IMF and others are commenting that it will be around 5%, which is the largest shrinking of economic output since the Second World War. That changes things fundamentally in terms of economic underpinning. So there we go. Um, we have those, those data points and those issues that frame this conversation about how do we reshape EU's industrial strategy. And I, I really, uh, uh, just to reinforce the fact, don't forget, this is not like every other conference. Those of you who participated, this is not about the speakers and then you asking questions to them. You are all in an equal position to help us think through this particular challenge of the day and the future years ahead. You all have a, a, a thought on this and to contribute to as, as we build this, a festival of politics and ideas, and we want to hear what you think should happen. How do we shift the politics, but also are there ideas out there that we should be focusing on? So firstly, I want to uh, warmly welcome Cece uh, Cecilia Malmström, uh, ex-trade commissioner, uh, to, to share with us your thinking. Cecilia, a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just say to you, can I just ask you very, uh, very just a difficult question? Um, is that given where we find ourselves with the COVID crisis, um, the, con the concept of sovereignty we know uh, is being bandied about quite significantly. We know because of the crisis that businesses have felt the sense of risk through the distant supply chains. And suddenly there's an inwardism taking place and a protectionism. Mm. Is sovereignty the right policy objective for the EU in the future? No, actually, I don't think so. I mean, the world has been, as you also mentioned, through the biggest crisis in a, in a century. We have had more than one million dead. We've had people hospitalized. We've had bankruptcies, unemployment, crushed to dreams, economies falling, and probably it's not over. And the whole world has suffered, even a little bit different depending on, on countries, but this is a global crisis. So the time is for more cooperation than ever. Because we have seen, uh, and it started before the crisis actually, democracy has been eroding, international organizations have been eroding, Europe has a very troublesome neighborhood, our, uh, our biggest partners, US and China, are not abiding by the rules, we see increasing ingress aggressive uh, investments by, by China and a deteriorating situation when it comes to human rights. We see U.S. engaged in trade wars and disregarding the, um, uh, the transatlantic relationship. So global world order is really under pressure. And no country is sovereign enough to deal with this alone. So what we need to do is, of course, to reinforce cooperation. And how can we do that? Well, Europe needs to do its homework. Recovery from this 
will take time. We have a lot to do. We need to make sure that the funds and the budgets that we have to our disposal, national and European, are invested in a wise way. It has to be sustainable recovery, it has to be innovative, it has to focus on digital, it has to future, uh, focus on, on the future. We need to take this moment to reform the internal market. This is long due. We've been needing to do reforms there for a long time, and there's enormous gains to be made if we take away obstacles like public procurement, standards, certificates. There is an estimation from the um, uh, internal market DG in the Commission saying that if we simplify the service sector on the internal market, we could gain up to 700 billion euros mm. until 2030. Mm. And of course, we need to help our, our SMEs with the digital transition and the skills. And we need to deal with the outside world. The global trading system needs to be upheld. It needs to be reformed. We need to work with allies to reform the WTO. Uh, we need to make sure that we continue to work with the free trade agreements that we have. Europe has been very successful in that, and we are actually gaining more than our partners from that. So we need to cultivate them, elaborate them, um, and, and deepen them, and make sure that those who we have concluded enter into force. And we need to improve the global level playing field, especially vis-a-vis -vis China. We need to make sure that the investment screening works, that we have trade defense in place, that we have an international procurement instrument, that we do the reforms that the Commission has announced on foreign subsidies when it comes to competition. And we need to push China, together with other allies, to, to reform. But we should not become protectionist. Import and export is good for Europe. It, have, it will be the key for the recovery. And some companies have, of course, changed and diversified their value chains. Uh, we need to focus much more on diversification, flexibility, and on creating an innovation-friendly environment. But Brussels cannot decide on the architecture of value chains. And we could possibly produce some strategic material and equipment in Europe, but we need to see if that is efficient as well. I mean, lithium mining is not built up over a day. But if we recover uh, and become stronger economically, we are also more resilient. And we can set a model in Europe for climate-friendly technology standards. And here we should seek global cooperation also on the issue of uh, border adjustment taxes. Where we need to be more sovereign, and I end with this, is in the foreign policy. Mm. We see that other partners are increasingly squeezing Europe, and we have not seen Europe really positioning itself in a strong geopolitical position. So we need to be more strategic. We need to be more united. We need to change the way we, need po we make policy uh, decisions. And we need to take a stronger responsibility for our own security. This crisis, if there's anything coming out of this that is positive, is the need, the show, the, the evidence that we need to cooperate together. And I think Europe can take a lead here, doing its own homework, but also being the leading partner in restoring global international cooperation. Cecilia, thank you very much. But you've been in the position where the current trade uh, uh, commissioner is. And imagine, you know, that, that's a, a breathless menu of issues that people need to Indeed. think about right now. I mean, it's tremendous, but actually it's also the, the historic moment that we're in demands that kind of attention. Um, but when you see right now the kind of narrating, em narrative emerging from the Commission, what's your sense? Are you worried? And I want you to... If, and B, I know that it's difficult because you've been there before and you don't want to uh, um, trash anyone that's in the position that you, you used to be, and I'm not asking you to do that, but I want you to comment on the narrative you're hearing and whether you recognise it um, or are you worried by it. And then that, that point you made about security, about where sovereignty matters, is say a little bit more about that, that because we have a session later on today around some of this issue, these issues, but I, I'm interested in the way you're linking our industrial approach, industrial strategic approach, with also security. Cecilia. Well, obviously, the new commission and the new commissioner is now in the face of formulating a new trade policy for the coming five years. Indeed. That's perfectly normal. Um, and there are some buzzwords there that I hope can be more operationalized because the concept of open strategic autonomy that is very often used in this 
is in my mind a bit vague and Indeed. very unclear what it actually means. I mean, you have open, open markets, you have strategic, absolutely, we should be strategic, but what is it autonomy? Because we are so interlinked in this world, so we, we cannot be autonomous and we shouldn't because we need trade and we need to engage even more. We need to do some changes. Some companies have already done that and maybe our panelists in, in a couple of minutes will, will refer to that. And we need to make sure that we level the playing field. So there will be a few changes. But uh, I think the, the, the current buzzword of this really needs to be operationalized because Europe cannot turn into protectionism. It would be a, a huge mistake because nobody has gained so much out of trade as the European Union the, the last decades. Indeed. And it would be a key to recover it to do that. But there will be some changes, obviously, as I mentioned, the le leveling the playing field, the investment screening, looking at competition, uh, and, and so on. And some companies have already, as I said, started to see whether some key products in, in raw materials or medical equipment could possibly be produced closer, or that you diversify your, your value chains. But that is, of course, a business decision, not a European, uh, not a, a Brussels decision. Indeed. On the security, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right, because if the European Union wants to be a geopolitical actor, as, as uh, President Ursula von der Leyen has said, we need to be strong in all areas. In trade, we can be strong. There we can make majority decisions. We are the, the biggest internal market in the world. We're a very attractive partner. We can mm. put demands, not only economically, but also promote our values. But we are much more handicapped in the foreign policy area, and we saw that when it came to uh, this, uh, deciding on, on sanctions, where Europe took a long time to really land in sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Belarus, uh, for instance. Uh, so we, we need to, to change the way we make decisions there. And combining economic recovery, being forceful in reforming the international multilateral system and pushing for, for changes there, taking a broader uh, responsibility for our security and foreign policy, will make Europe uh, a, a geopolitical actor. But that has to go together, because otherwise we're just half, half strong. And we have seen in a changing world where Europe is quite alone, I have to say, uh, regrettably, we need to be stronger on all these areas. Uh, thank you, because, you know, on the one hand, there's a, such a great opportunity with the recalcitrant USA and others uh, operating the way they are. There's a great opportunity for Europe to actually walk in and or rather mm -hmm. create a mutuality and use its diplomatic muscle in different ways to do some of the things you do. And also you're referring to something which I think requires a very sophisticated change management strategy. And, the you know, Team EU needs to work very differently to actually achieve some of this. But, you know, let, let's hope but that inherent contradiction about open and autonomous um, there's that kind of a double speak around that it's almost trying to assuage the concerns internally um, uh, that almost point to a kind of a bunker mentality which I hope that's not the case in the future, but then also trying to convince the others that actually we're still committed to a, a social economy, an open marketplace, if you like. And these are some of the inherent contradictions that we're likely to uh, face. But let's focus on what, what, what's the art of possible as well. Um, thank you very much. And I want to move on to um, uh, a French politician who's joining us here today. But before I do invite you, Agnes, um, I want to share with you um, a slide on our citizens um, poll, uh, our annual poll that we do, we've been doing for the past three years. And we asked over 10,500 Europeans, what should the 11 members, you know, from the 11 member states, what should the EU prioritise over the next five years? And look at that. 44% want the EU to generate economic growth through job skills creation within the EU. I mean, you'd, you'd say, well, absolutely, uh, go figure. Of course, that's obvious. But in the context we find ourselves, when the other options were about uh, what we do around health and the, you know, the, the COVID uh, crisis, uh, as well as climate change, I think it's interesting that people, um, it's not interesting, but it's absolutely obvious that we've got this percentage across the board that actually want this as a priority how that fits into the kind of changes that are happening in terms of digital, what we heard of the potential implications of the bio-revolution um, and, and other matters. There's a real sense here that those who are already on the edge of the marketplace are likely to fall off a very a big height, but for a very long time, if we don't make the transition from where we are now to the kind of place we want to be, which is greener, 
more digital, but also more equal. So it um, gives me great pleasure to invite Agnès um, Panier uh, ranoucher who's the French Minister uh, de uh, Delegate for Industry. And it's very warm welcome to you. Um, and thank you for joining us. Can you share with us? Hi. Welcome to you. Um, hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you very much for being with us. It's great to have you here. Because um, it's our busy times everywhere, but particularly in France at the moment, I know. So we really welcome, welcome your time with us. Tell us, what's your sense of how member states have responded to the crisis we find ourselves in, in terms of both COVID but also financial. What's your sense of how they've responded and what does it say uh, about us, firstly? Well, I, I would say that, first of all, uh, there was a strong and quick answer from the European Union and from the uh, members of the European Union all together. And this was absolutely instrumental for us to uh, be in a position to struggle with this uh, virus. Uh, all the measures we took were crucial in allowing us to pull through the initial peak uh, of the crisis. First of all, the adapted uh, um, state aid framework, the emergency support instrument, patient transfers, temporary support to mitigate unemployment risks, in an emergency, the sure, to assist member states with accrued social spending. The agreement we reached in the space of a few months uh, on the new multi-annual finan financial framework and the recovery and resilience facility is also absolutely historic. And, and I think that the crisis helped us in a way to uh, accelerate uh, the agenda regarding reforms and capacity or capability to work together. This is on, on the first hand. On the second hand, at the level of the countries, we have seen that we, we have some uh, uh, vulnerabilities regarding our own industry value chains. Uh, and that uh, the, it has shown that our economy is at risk of sudden supply disruptions. Um, this uh, crisis has hence highlighted a clear need to reacquire our industrial capacity. But we also show that uh, the capacity and capability of industrial companies were there and that we were in a, in a capacity to turn production very quickly to uh, the uh, protection goods we need. Uh, for instance, in France, we managed to increase uh, our uh, mask production capabilities from 3.5 million to 20 million per week in a few weeks, and we are now at 50, uh, 60 million per week uh, mask productions. So it proves that when you are under pressure, mm -hmm. uh, the companies and the European companies can deliver quickly and that they are much more flexible mm -hmm. than you may anticipate. I can say the same things regarding respirators in France sure. or uh, uh, over, uh, uh, over productions. So I do believe that there is on the one hand uh, a lot of uh, um, strengths that we have proved uh, to to and that we have shown in this crisis, and on the other hand, the vulnerabilities that were highlighted during uh, the last semester are uh, to be tackled through uh, a much more ambition and ambitious industrial policy, and we are able to deliver on this uh, ambit ambitious industrial policy. Okay, thank you for that. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a kind of a, a strike of confidence there about delivering because, um, and I, I hear what you say and we hear what you say, but the early stages of response in the EU was uh, really marked by a lack of solidarity, but it, pe it picked up pace, as you know, and people did do the right thing finally. But we've heard from Cecilia about what the challenges are. Um, in terms of your, your confidence that we can deliver an ambitious industrial strategy, um, how do we... How do we make sure that the, the changes or the improvements we've been seeking on the single market for 
decades. You know, people have wanted the single market to be much more improved, and we've heard what the prize is if we get it right. Um, what do you think needs to shift in terms of the single market, but also the kind of industrial strategy we should be looking towards? You know, France is a big player, politically, economically. Um, in terms of your other par partners, tell us, what, what do you, what's your view? Well, regarding the signal market, uh, we have uh, yet room for improvement. We have room for improvement on the financial aspects. And uh, this is something that uh, we support greatly in, in France. But we have also room for improvement on the services. From my perspective, uh, we favor a uh, um, sector by sector approach, bottom up approach, uh, in which you show uh, all the uh, difficulties that companies have to access to uh, uh, each country uh, market uh, regarding services. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, we can handle this uh, situation through a, a global approach. It has to be bottom up based on uh, facts and data. And I'm sure that we can move forward on that. And this is exactly uh, what we are working on uh, currently. On uh, the industrial policy, um, I would say that first, we need to catalyze investments in strategic value chains, sectors and technologies that are key to our citizens' safety and security. Uh, we have done uh, that we have we have shown that uh, investing in uh, electric battery yeah. or in electronics proved to be effective in Europe, and we may have the same approach on the uh, strategic value chains that the European Commission uh, has pushed uh, regarding health, regarding hydrogen, uh, and and many other aspects on which. China and the United States are currently investing massively. Mm -hmm. And if we want to be strong, and I agree with uh, Commissioner Malmström that we need to be strong, but we need to be in an open mind and not in a protectionist mind. Uh, if we want to be strong, we have to build a competitive edge. And to build a competitive edge means investing in innovation, enhancing competences, uh, in our labor skills and uh, supporting digital and green transitions. That is massive okay. investments to be done now. Thank you. And let's bring other people in um, over this discussion in terms of uh, what specifically can happen, as you've just described, uh, given that member states often, on the one hand, will come together on certain aspects, but on fundamentals like national regulations and rules uh, that don't want to give them up uh, in terms of their own sovereignty. I want to move swiftly on to our next contributor. And I'm mindful that, you know, those of you who want to ask a question, raise an issue, please make sure you use um, the virtual hand or those of live stream hashtag state of EU to engage, post your questions and issues or, 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 or inquiries around this. I want to turn to the private sector now. We have the chairman of the board of directors of Engie, Jean-Pierre Clamadieu. Jean-Pierre, thank you very much for joining us. A very warm welcome to you. Um, Jean-Pierre, you, your company is uh, a household name. People know about what you do globally and in Europe, etc. Um, what role is Engie playing? Uh, to decarbonize economy, our economy in a sustainable way? I just need you to speak up a bit. We can't hear you. I think you've muted yourself, Jean-Pierre. Yeah, sorry. Should be better this way. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Well, okay, welcome thank to you. Again. Okay, so. I was trying to be discreet on the first part. <laughs> no, I was saying that NG is indeed a very large uh, utility. We employ uh, 170,000 uh, people around the world, mm -hmm. but we have made energy transition our raison d'être. We really, we are really, we are focusing uh, not only in optimizing our, uh, our footprint in terms of uh, CO2 emission, but we are also very active in helping our clients, local governments, uh, industries, uh, households, 
reduce their own impact. And this is really something we've been doing, this twofold approach that we've been developing uh, over, the, uh, over the past few years. And if I take just a, a few numbers, and I don't want to overload you with, uh, with numbers, but the company has reduced its CO2 emission footprint by 50% in the past uh, uh, four years, thanks to a very aggressive exit from all coal-based uh, uh, production facilities. We have today about 100 gigawatt of electricity capacity, which makes us a very large producer. A third of them are renewable, uh, hydro, wind, and solar. And we currently have in our pipe about 10 gigawatt of, uh, of new project. We are the largest developer of solar and wind in France. We are very large developers in the US, in Brazil, and in a number of, uh, of European uh, countries. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we are a large gas transporter and distributors in, in France, and we are very active uh, in turning this uh, gas into green gases, short-term biomethane, longer-term hydrogen. So all of this makes us indeed a, a very large uh, actor in the energy transition. And by the way, we welcome the initiative taken by the Commission. The Green Deal for us is a great enabler, a great accelerator of the energy transition in Europe, and it fits very well with uh, at what NG is willing to uh, is willing to do. Uh, maybe with one exception, if mm. I may, Please. which are green gases. We think that the uh, we think that the EU is a little bit timid regarding green gases. Biomethane, by the way, it's, uh, it echoes to what was being said in the uh, in the keynote speech about the importance of uh, bio. Uh, we have today ways to produce. Uh, uh, gas, CH4, methane, out of um, out of renewable uh, plants or out of uh, out of waste, and this is a great element of a circular economy. And we think that it's something which should find its role uh, into the uh, European energy uh, energy transition. What do you think needs to happen for that to actually happen? So what, you, what probably, do you want? What, uh, you know, you've got you, you, there's a group of people here, all of them are in different ways engaged in Europe, um, and this is about ideas and solutions. Uh, and you're just saying, for, uh, you're, and as you say, you're, you're very significant, a player. Um, what can you do with others to shift that? Well, uh, going back to one of the theme of this debate, which is uh, European industrial policy, mm -hmm. uh, we welcome the fact that the word industrial policy is becoming an important part of uh, Europe's ways of acting. Uh, and that's, uh, that's really something that, that we've seen. It's a trend we've seen emerging in a, a few years ago. Indeed, the COVID crisis, uh, as Agnès mentioned, have accelerated this trend, and we welcome it. Uh, the idea that European policymakers can indeed help develop a key supply chain uh, which will contribute to the energy transition, but at the same time create uh, job and innovation opportunities throughout Europe is something which is indeed very powerful. I think the best example uh, so far is probably the battery initiative. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, I was... Uh, I was the head of Solvay, uh, a chemical company involved in some uh, in the production of some battery components, and I've seen Commissioner Serkovic launching this idea, starting mm -hmm. with a very simple uh, concept. Europe is encouraging the development of electric vehicles. At the same time, the key component of electric vehicle, which is battery, is being yeah. produced in China, Korea, or Japan. And there was this initiative launch to uh, promote the development of a battery industry in Europe. Today, this is becoming a reality. Mm. We've seen two large battery factory projects being developed currently in, uh, in Europe uh, with the support of large European industrial companies, with the support of uh, government. France, Germany have been very active. The EU obviously was, uh, was very active. And I think this is the model of initiatives that we want to see happening. Uh, and the next, uh, probably the next important uh, uh, subject regarding energy transition is hydrogen. Mm -hmm. The same concept is being developed regarding uh, regarding hydrogen, and we've seen the EU encouraging the development of an hydrogen alliance using, sorry for the, uh, the complex acronym, the, but the uh, IPCEI concept, which means important project of common interest in Europe. Of course and it is. Uh, Why wouldn't you name it anything else? Go on, sorry. <laughs> 
said so volumes uh, about the commission. In this acronym, yeah. we see the willingness of Europe to use various policy tools, sure. uh, competition laws, which are being which are made flexible in this uh, in this concept. Uh, obviously, some support uh, regarding investment. Okay. We see member states supporting this, and indeed, this is a very powerful way to create a European industry aligned with the objective of the energy transition. And, and yes. my wish is mm -hmm. probably that we don't. My wish is first that we move quickly on hydrogen. That's uh, that's obvious, but also that we look at other technologies. If I think of um, uh, renewable energy, wind, and especially offshore wind, has a very significant potential. Indeed. We need new technologies, uh, floating uh, windmills, which uh, which is something uh, which is a project on which uh, NG is uh, is working. And I think European support would make this technology could make this technology available sooner. And this is something that we should uh, focus on. And if I may add one last point of course. about financing. Yes. Uh, first, NG is a very large issuer of green bonds. Last year, we've issued more than 3 billion euros of green bonds, uh -huh. which means that we believe that finance can indeed support the energy transition. We are looking uh, with a great interest at uh, what's called the European taxonomy of investment, which mm -hmm. is a way uh, to decide what investments are green and needs to be encouraged and what investments are uh, should not be encouraged. We are a little bit worried when we see uh, some of the some of the concepts which are behind this taxonomy. If we are not very careful, we could exclude a number of projects. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of gas uh, because gas is a, a very important element of the energy transition for the next decades. And moving from coal to gas is a very pow powerful way to reduce CO2 emission. Mm -hmm. But more than that, gas can become greener mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the development of biomethane and, hyd and hydrogen. And when we look at the detail of this taxonomy, we see yeah. situations where we would exclude some projects which indeed are very important for the European energy transition. So a lot of hope seeing that uh, European industrial policy uh, could become indeed a strong catalyst or a strong enabler of the energy transition. But at the same time, let's be let's be attentive and let's not create obstacle which would reduce the financing available. Jean-Pierre, thank you. Um, and our resident cartoonist obviously created that very powerful image, which is not a comment on what you're like saying, it. but it's great, <laughs> no? Um, but what I suppose the message is speed and acceleration, but do that in a broad tent with the private sector. But come back to that, because I'd like us to think about what are specific things that could happen as a result of this conversation. I want to bring in our audience. So I have Carl Benedict Frey. Carl? Can I oh, take very the well, opportunity welcome. to ask two questions, please? So on the one hand, we have but Hang on, Ken, before you, before you launch in, say who you are, where you're from, before you ask that Sorry. question. Carl Frey, I run the program on the future of work at Oxford Martin School at Oxford uh, University. Okay. Uh, as my Russian background probably reveals. Um, so I have a question to the panel, please. So um, on the one hand, there seems to be this tension between openness, Europe has been a great beneficiary of trade, but the pandemic has shown, or at least some think it has shown, that we need to become more self-sufficient. And my question is, uh, I mean, almost anything can be argued these days needs to be produced internally. I mean, nobody thought that we would have to produce face masks in Europe uh, before this pandemic. And there seems to be an argument that almost anything can now all of a sudden become a national security threat or something you need to produce internally uh, in a time of crisis. My question is, how do you think about that trade-off? Isn't it more about diversifying supply chains, not to be too dependent on one player, than having the internal capacity uh, to produce everything uh, yourself? Thank you. Carl, thank you. Uh, don't forget what I said earlier on. This is not a classic conference. We don't have a panel and people respond. This is a whole group. It's about the brain in this forum and elsewhere that you engage with to actually create a response to what you're saying. Um, it might be useful if you could use a chat function to say what you think. What do you think should happen uh, so that some of our contributors and th those of your colleagues in this Zoom um, uh, uh, room can actually contribute and engage with you on that? And you heard from Cecilia earlier on who made a very powerful comment about the fact that actually um, we can't suddenly become inward thing, inward looking. We can't change the supply chain overnight. I want to go to twi uh, uh, someone from Twitter, Alex, uh, from our, our live uh, live stream audience. Alex, 
I believe we have a Hi, question. Kendra. Hello. I believe we have a question from the people on the live stream. We do, yes. Good morning, everybody. So our question from Twitter is, what impact will the ambitious goals of the European Green Deal have on Europe's industry? And how does Europe make sure that the ambitious emission goals will not leave anyone behind? Excellent. Thank you very much. That gives me a great segue into our next contributor uh, who can respond to and think about some of this. We, and we are very pleased to have Frank Hemskirk here, Secretary General of the European Ta Roundtable uh, for Industry, uh, a very significant body, um, a significant player, and obviously been involved quite closely in uh, the development of Europe's approach to an industrial strategy. Uh, a warm welcome to you, Frank. Thank you for joining us. Frank, if you Thank you so much. Hello. Um, if you can share with us what your sense is of how do we now create economic value, given where we find ourselves? You, 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 um, I sh we shared with you the poll results from citizens. Um, but given the crisis, the economic crisis and the political, well, the economic and social crisis being created, how does Europe create economic value now? Well, you know, ultimately, economic value is uh, the means to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, let me also put that uh, clearly. Um, uh, and by the way, let me also respond to one of the questions on uh, uh, autonomy uh, and let's say the security and should we produce everything in-house uh, in, in, in one, every individual member state? And the answer there is, of course, no. Strategic autonomy should not become autarky. Um, uh, um, but I explain strategic autonomy as, let's say, Europe needs to be master of its own destiny. Uh, we need to have choices, alternatives. Uh, and how, you know, do we become, let's say, more sovereign, stronger? Uh, that's building alliances. It's, it's, it's building up, let's say, diversifying value change. And that's, by the way, also how the European Roundtable for Industry started in the, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it is making sure that Europe creates, let's say, growth, prosperity, jobs for, for everyone. Uh, it's also not about, let's say, big companies versus small companies. That's a very old discussion. Eh? Small companies need, need big companies to scale up. Big companies need smaller companies because they're often more agile or they're more uh, innovative. And that's the ecosystem in which we operate. Uh, but if you look about the economic value created by the relatively big firms in Europe, the sad message is that we're not doing that well. Eh? Europe is not done... Uh, good enough in terms of competitiveness, mm -hmm. not in the tech fields where right? we've not created uh, global winners. If you look to our share in the uh, uh, S&P 500 eh, of the big companies, we're declining more than you would expect based upon GDP growth outside of Europe. And why is that a problem? Because also big companies, let's say they have career opportunities. Uh, um, they often have a home country bias. They tend to invest more R&D in the region or in the country where their headquarters is based. So in that sense, um, we really need to step up. Um, and, 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 and my chairman, uh, Karin Swanberg, once said, maybe we as CEOs also have neglected Europe a bit. Mm, uh, we've been too busy globalizing, eh, expanding in China and in the US. We took Europe for granted and maybe the politicians for them, they had so much on their agenda, the euro crisis, the migration crisis, uh, that competitiveness was and economic growth was not high enough on the uh, political agenda. And therefore, uh, I'm actually quite optimistic mm -hmm. because the entire response to COVID has also been, you know, recovery and renew and link it to the trend transitions and to skills. So let's get our act together. Frank, thank you very much. I want to bring in a couple of people before I ask you, uh, uh, you know, a follow-up because I'm really keen that people participate in this because I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves, colleagues, in this room is that what should uh, a future industrial strategy look like? We've had various views. How should it behave? What should it be underpinned by based on all your collective experience? And I think use the chat function to suggest what you think um, should be the, you know, the, the, uh, the emerging, developing uh, future industrial strategy, because we had one version, and obviously, you know, COVID threw that off, off kilter, uh, but we're, in, we're moving to another place. Um, I've got uh, Alan Beattie. Alan? 
Um, hi, folks. I've got a question about the wider you're global... From, uh, can I just say the, the, the benefit of people? You're from the Financial Times. Is that right, Alan? Oh, yes. I'm a trade writer for the Financial Times in Brussels. Welcome. Hello. Um, I have a question about the wider global dimension. I was reading um, the Joe Biden campaign statements recently where he talks about creating strategic alliances with, uh, with like-minded countries. And clearly there are a bunch of sectors. Rare Earths is one. Tech actually is another where the EU is quite underdeveloped. Yes. Um, and is going to find it hard to go it alone. I just wonder what uh, what potential people think there is for putting together alliances with, with uh, economies like the US and becoming resilient, as it were, as a transatlantic bloc uh, rather than by itself. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll come back to them. Those of you who are on, on, on here on Zoom, use the chat function to respond to that question. Because as I've said before, we're all in this together, if you like, not to use an unfortunate statement from the past. Um, but, um, and Alan, you've been covering these issues for some time. It'll be interesting to have your own views of whether you have a sense of optimism that we've learnt from experience thus far. And given the politics we find ourselves in, what's the likelihood of that happening? But, you know, a Biden affair might create a different transatlantic relationship. I want to move to Rupert. Rupert Schlegelmilk? Yes, hello. Thank you for giving me the floor here. I mean, I wanted to come back a Please little bit. Please do introduce yourself so that we yes, all know. I'm Rupert. Rupert Schlegelmilch, I'm a director at the uh, European Commission working on trade issues in, 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 um, in particular with the US, but I wanted to make a more general point about the role of trade policy because that's where the discussion started and yeah. Cecilia made a couple of points. Um, and I would like to start by saying uh, that we're actually reviewing our policy, not only because of the crisis, uh, but also because even before the crisis, we realized that the world was changing uh, think uh, the, the spat between the U.S. Uh, and China. Think the role of uh, supply chains, which had been questioned even before by mm -hmm. some of the uh, policies we saw around the world. I mean, we had already uh, signals that things were not as they were before. And now comes the crisis, which sort of impl amplifies all of that. But I wanted to start by giving you some numbers, because evidence-based policies are really important here. If you look at the product mix of what Europe imports, you will actually see we looked at 5,000 or some studies looked at 5,000 products and there is only 26 products in there which come from one country. And there are 90 which come from three countries and there are 99% of all our imports which come from more than 10 sources. We're actually more diversified as we were. And I say that to make sure that we understand that strategic open autonomy is something which has to be really surgical. Obviously, we had a problem with masks and we had to take some measures in May. But if you look at the broader picture, uh, there is no case to be made that we are dependent. Uh, we're actually less dependent than the US, for example, on some of these products. Uh, and we're doing uh, all we can, I mean, to get that message across. Because okay. otherwise, if you really want to reach all these things, we're not going to go uh, very far without having exorbitant costs. The other point I wanted to make, uh, because we also talked about the Green Deal and what can trade policy produce there, that will be a huge challenge. Uh, that is very clear. And I'm not only talking about issues like uh, adjusting at the border the carbon costs that might not be otherwise reflected in the cost of products coming in. It's also about leveling the playing field uh, worldwide in a way which is cooperative. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. But Rupert, can I, just, can I just ask you, what, how, what's your response to what Alan, Alan Beattie just raised? Yes, I don't want to monopolize the debate, but on the US, I think it is, it is a very difficult issue because it takes two to really have an alliance of equals or at least where you see eye to eye and you're not instrumentalized, which sometimes is uh, happening in alliances. But uh, the, base, the bottom line is that if you look at the challenges of a living playing field in the world, the big emerging economies, uh, there are no better partners than the EU and the US because we do share, uh, irrespective of what the current administration sometimes might do, we do share a general belief in open markets, level playing fields, rule okay. of law, etc. Okay. That's, that's why we have to build these alliances where we can, and Europe has to go up a little bit on some of these issues like tech in order to be a valuable partner. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm not going to push you because given you know the role you play, because you're not going to say you know that there's there's you know there's all this crap floating around in terms of the negotiations that, and also we need to really get our act together in relation to the technology side of what what, what uh, Alan was saying. But Agnes, can I bring you in in response to uh, the very interesting question that uh, that Alan has raised around you know the. 
the potential for um, the, the relationship with the US in, in a, let's say, in a Biden affair, uh, in particular in relation to technology. Um, what we've known in the epidemic, um, I mean, the pandemic, is that the five big tech giants have soaked up most of the gain on, uh, on you know, in share price, in shares, and in terms of profit. Um, what's your view? France is a big player in this. Well, um, it, it, it will uh, lie us with something else I wanted to, to raise regarding uh, how to uh, balance uh, reshoring and open, open economy. Uh, the key point, I would say, is to have in mind what was just mentioned, that is our uh, objective should be playing level field. And as you mentioned, uh, the big platforms, uh, we may have some... Uh, um, questions uh, uh, regarding uh, the, the, the way they address the market, their business model, and the fact that they have an easy access to our single market with, uh, without paying uh, the uh, entry ticket for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, we need to rebalance the, uh, or to have this playing, uh, to, level a, to level a playing field if we want to, to be uh, efficient, uh, but not to be protectionist. And, uh, and I believe this is key. Uh, and it has to go with the competitive uh, uh, com competition uh, policy. Uh, I believe that we need to change the rules regarding competition policies to take into account the fact that digital platforms do not have the same business models as brick and mortar companies. Mm -hmm. And this is just an economic uh, fact, and we need to draw some consequences from this economic fact. Uh, second, uh, when we um, work on a green transition, environment transition, and we push some norms on European companies, mm -hmm. there is a question regarding how do uh, goods enter the uh, single market without respecting those norms, but having access to the market. And, and once again, we need to level uh, the playing field mm -hmm. between uh, goods that are produced abroad and goods that are produced internally. If uh, goods coming from uh, um, China or uh, Asia, or whatever, do have the same level of CO2 emissions and do respect uh, some environment norms, I'm more than happy to welcome them in the uh, okay. single market. But if you do not, then there is an issue and there is a question regarding reciprocity. And we do not, sure. we shouldn't be naive regarding that. And I believe this is the way to address the question regarding sourcing of uh, goods sourcing of services be, uh, between outside Europe and inside Europe. Sure. Alice, uh, how confident are you, are you about the, the relationship with the US if there was a Biden administration? I mean, if you've got big fat cats uh, who are global and almost, you know, larger than uh, many countries are running uh, the digital space um, in your backyard, you're going to protect them, aren't you? <laughs> Well, we need also to be, uh, you know, to develop our own capabilities. We cannot wait uh, for, okay. uh, or we cannot protect, uh, we cannot, uh, sorry, um, refuse to have access to the big fat cats if we are not able on our side in, in our own countries to build uh, the capacities and capabilities to deliver the same level of service. There is a question regarding where do we stand uh, on uh, digital economy? How do we address the cloud uh, situation? Uh, how do uh, the uh, uh, European companies uh, uh, are able to have access to services that are the same level of quality than those uh, digital companies, American digital companies? So, and there are some China Chinese companies such as uh, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, etc. So this is more or less the same question. So we do have two questions. The first one is uh, level playing field. 
and sure. this has to be addressed through competition policies. But the second question is, what are we able to build at the European level to deliver the same level of services? And uh, are we able to build a European cloud uh, capability, uh, a digital uh, algorithm capability? And, and then we come to strategic value chains, and then we come to IPCEI. Uh, we cannot just stay and say, oh, those guys, they are so good, uh, but we will uh, put some protectionism uh, measures to stop them at the border. This is not manageable. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. And I suppose what, I take a leaf out what um, Jean-Pierre said, that there's something about the agility with which on certain initiatives you move together really well. And um, there's something about the industrial strategy has to be a different pivot point that people like NG and others are brought together to hub in a way that looks at the cross-cutting aspects of the strategy uh, from digital green etc so that you are able to compete in a different way it's almost like doing business differently than we have done in the past but perhaps again people respond to that uh, on the chat function and also you know again also respond to the thing about what should the future strategy sh look like uh, i want to first go to borja if i've got the name right my apologies if in advance if i have or yeah not. it's correct Excellent. Yeah. Introduce yourself and what, what's your idea or your, your thought to you want to share with us or a question? Now, first of all, good morning, everyone. My name is Borja Saet. I'm, I'm currently uh, doing a research fellowship at the Institute of uh, European Democrats. And I think it's really interesting the, the, the question that you raised, you know, how, how our economy should look like. And if we think about how it should look like, first of all, we will probably all agree that it should be based on a circular economy and sustainability, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we agree that we should produce the basic needs that we have, that we have seen during this pandemic. And the third thing it should be based on, should be based on innovation and research and development. Now, uh, how can we do this? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about two main things. Okay. I'm thinking about uh, creating a regulatory framework. So for example, here in Spain, we, we were pioneers in in making every construction, um, so every construction, every new construction here had to put solar panels or a percentage, 10% uh, of their percentage uh, of energy should come from renewable energies. Now, uh, this will push companies also to go towards the circular economy or a more renewable energy economy. Mm -hmm. However, we have another thing that we need and it's funds, right? How can the European Union or government boost the certain key sectors that are and are <clears throat> sorry main uh, are mainly based in research and development? <coughs> and here we have I see two main things. We are in the middle of of China as we are talking now, and uh, China has these famous five year plans, right? So they will put during these five years they will say, now we are going to go into solar economy. Uh, in the solar sector, their main four banks, state-owned banks, will push all the money towards that sector, and in five years, they will be the first ones in the in the okay. world. Okay, all right. Now, so how can we do this in the European Union? Should we change our state okay. aid policies? Okay. Should we fund certain uh, sectors in the economy? Borja, thank you very much. But also, I suppose, when, when we constantly refer to China, I suppose one thing that we constantly forget is it's a very much uh, top-down approach. It's an autocracy that's able to move and shift things. And as Cecilia was saying earlier, we don't have that same capacity through you know, consensus voting, etc. Um, and we need to think about that. I want to move to Nina. Nina Rawal, one of our European Young Leaders. Welcome to you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for this interesting conversation together. Yeah, no, as I said, I think about industrial policy. I, I'm a venture capital investor in the health space. Times in our world. And I guess the comment I would like to make is around as we look ahead uh, and how we bring innovation to market, why in, in, in the area of health, but I would extend it to say that it will be the same in other areas of innovation. It, it tends to be the US that's the engine on the commercial side. And very simplified, I guess you could say that's based on kind of the single market, as we heard about before, but also uh, aggressive pricing. And what I would like to throw in this conversation is just to say, how can Europe think about 
Oh, so you're cutting, your, um, Nina, your, your transmission's not that clear. Could you either come closer to the mic so that I, we can all hear, perhaps it's just me, but I can't hear. You're just about to come up with something as an idea about the, the single market, I believe. Sorry, apologies, I thought I had good connection. Can you hear me better? That's so much clearer. Apologies. That's no, nice. I just wanted to throw in to say, how can Europe, as we talked about new business models in tech, but also in other areas, how can Europe think about a different model, business model that is not just built on aggressive pricing? Because of course, in areas such as healthcare and other kind of necessary areas, um, that's unsustainable to just drive very aggressive pricing generation. So how can we think about new models, new business models that are not just built on um, aggressive pricing that can guarantee affordability? That's my thought. Nina, thank you. And do, do you think that's about uh, people like you and other entre entrepreneurs being able to club together and create a different kind of movement and space around that sector in particular? I think that's one area, but I also think one of the unique things that Europe has is these single payer models in healthcare, but in other welfare states. So they can be a very powerful um, leader in a different model than just uh, the American and one we are trying to play. Interesting, yes, point. Perfect, Interesting point. Thank you. Carl Benedict, Benedict, if I've got that right. Hello, warm welcome to you. Hello. Introduce yourself uh, and yeah. your issue or question or idea. So I'm still Carl Frey, got to Oxford Martin School, Oxford University. Ah, um, sorry, I didn't yet. Thank you. Um, so uh, I have just a very brief remark I would like to make. And it seems to be a very strong focus in Europe in particular on American tech giants. And I'm not sure exactly why we are obsessing so much about them. If you look at US productivity growth, it's been in decline for a decade. They're not having much of an impact on the main economy yet. Artificial okay. intelligence is not yet a mature technology. There's a lot more innovation in the first place for that to have an impact on the real economy. And it seems to be the case that most people in Europe do believe that the market structure that fosters competition rather than a market structure that is built on monopoly and market power is better for innovation. So maybe we should have some more confidence in the model that we currently have, is that that competition is going to deliver valuable innovation. And even if we think that it's a problem that European companies haven't failed to scale up, American companies that have scaled up have not been creating many jobs. The big exception is Amazon. Okay. So. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, Europe has an advantage in uh, having a very diverse um, uh, industry in terms of a lot of um, good SMEs and strong competition. So maybe we should foster sort of a focus on that advantage rather than not having. So, so what you're saying is, vive la, la free market and let it go, let it be rampant and unfettered to create solutions. Uh, but I'm, that, that's me being controversial response to you, but perhaps something to think about because there is that raging debate. I want to bring in Shay Van Dijk. Shay? Yes. Hello. Hi. I'm not sure if I've got your name I'm right. And uh, just introduce yourself. And it's Shay Van Dijk, yes, very good. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm calling in from the u.s west coast okay and i have a spotty internet so i apologize that i can't i think it's better for me not to join with video okay but i've i'm i've spent 20 years in europe and um during the entire lockdown i've been here in in california what um, do you do? I mean, are you going from an like organization or institution? Yes, I'm the, I'm the head of the Digital Leadership Institute that is Brussels-based. Um, and um, our mission is inclusive digital transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, the things that I, I, first, I must vehemently agree with the last gentleman who said, uh, essentially, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think the, the European... Um, growth strategy is is actually a healthy one that uh -huh. focuses on sustainable, incremental, positive growth, and not um, this kind of very risk oriented. I think um, growth model driven by Silicon Valley and venture capital investment in the U.S. Mm -hmm. that has really dominated the global discussion on how to build economies, and I don't agree. 
actually that that's the healthiest way forward. And I and I think that embracing this more um, you know sustainable, I would even go as far to say a feminine growth model that okay. um, is that underpins the the social democratic ideal of Europe yeah. is actually something worth um, I think putting our arms around more more wholeheartedly and even um, showcasing as a growth model that can be adopted in other regions of the world, including in the United States, because yep. it's true this has not been a, a successful kind of all or, or all or nothing approach. And my comments in the chat were about some specific things that I've experienced in um, you know, looking at this question from a lot of different perspectives, uh -huh, okay. I hate to, to forget about the importance of investing in human capital and so, the so discussion around this. skills. Yes, yeah, so skills, um, also uh, vulnerable demographics that are overlooked, especially women in Europe that have Absolutely. not, um, you know, are still not, um, are, in fact, there are fewer women tech experts in Europe today than there was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is a disaster yeah. because it feeds into innovation, it feeds into entrepreneurship. Of course. And, and without looking at that and getting our, our minds and hearts around that issue, uh -huh. you can talk about any kinds of models of growth. Indeed. You can talk about investments in, in any kinds of different sectors. But if you don't have the actual people who are doing the work, applying their innovative ca capacity to problem solving with their skill sets, um, then you basically have nothing. Absolutely. And I think York. that's also yeah. a, a, a key opportunity that Europe has with the diversity Jay, of thank its you. human capital. Thank you. And thank you for raising that kind of interesting um, comment that others have raised in foreign policy is about you know, feminist foreign policy. Do we need a feminist or, you know, much as you called it, a feminine industrial... Feminine. In, fe feminine. No, 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 you did. I was going to say, I was about to say, oh, yeah, okay. people have said about the feminist po foreign policy, but you're talking about a feminine industrial strategy. What should that look like? Um, and how should that behave? It's a question I've been asking all of you. Please put on the chat what the characteristics should be and what you, th what you think we need to learn from and move forward. I have very limited time, and I want to bring back um, some of our contributors. And please, do continue this chat. Uh, and you know, think about what we might shift with some of the ideas that some of our contributors have come up with. Um, Jean-Pierre, I want to bring you back, if I, if I may, in terms of some of your, your thoughts on what you've heard so far, because it's great coming up with stuff that says we sh you should do that, you should do this. But in the context of this forum, what, what are the practical things we could do? There are a number of people in this room and in our network uh, and in your network. What could we do? Let me uh, share a, a couple of comments which are reasonably optimistic comments. I think there are areas where Europe has the ability to lead the world and the, the transformation of our economy into a more sustainable economy is indeed an area where Europe uh, has a head start. And uh, not to go into a into long description, if you just take the subject of uh, sustainable mobility, mm. uh, I think Europe has the ability to be a leader. When it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, electric vehicle, when it comes to trains, I'm very optimistic that Europe will be the first place in the world where a zero emission plane will be developed. Airbus is very active, is working very actively on okay. this. So there are areas where Europe has the ability to lead the way. And second, reasonably optimistic comment, I think we've seen in the past couple of years with the Green Deal of, uh, of the new commission and then the recovery plans which have been put in place uh, uh, to uh, mitigate the effect of the COVID crisis, we've seen a very significant amount of resources being put at work uh, in the European economy to accelerate this green transition. Uh, and I think the challenge for us now is to make sure that we work together more effectively. You've mentioned, several people mentioned the necessity to create industrial consortium along the supply chain, yeah. making sure that people who are working in various elements which contributes to the green economy will work together more effectively. I think we need also a bit more coordination between what's being done at the EU level and what's being done at the country level. But mm -hmm. overall, I think that we are starting to see a real, very significant amount of resources being made available. And I think it's also up to us corporates 
to take these resources to make the best use of them and to work much more effectively with our various stakeholders. Indeed, I'm glad you said that because yesterday people spoke a lot about the need for a stakeholder capitalism model rather than a shareholder model. And you know, some of the things you've said today references uh, a much more, I suppose, enlightened approach to a great extent. But it's a case of how you get other uh, companies on board and that point you made about being uh, m local as well. But I suppose the thing is, that how do we not create a lost generation? in the revolution that we're, we're, we're engaging in at the moment, whether that's technological or, or elsewhere. But I'm not gonna ask you to comment on that. You can put the views on the chat because I'm running out of time. I wanna bring in Cecilia back, actually. You kicked us off and I really do wanna kind of g bring as many of you who have been contributing at the beginning to kind of reflect on this. Cecilia, some of your thoughts on what you've heard so far in terms of like, how do we move the, how do we move the dial on the industrial strategy? Well, that is really the key issue that will be testimony whether Europe can get out uh, of this crisis. It's about using the recovery money wisely. It's about putting the Green Deal into action. It's about changing some of the, the uh, focuses when it comes to digital, when it comes to artificial intelligence. It's about including skills and education, research, etc., and to put all that uh, together. Uh, and then, of course, it could be a beautiful document, but it has to work in, in practice as yeah. well. And then not forgetting that Europe is not alone in this world. And hopefully there could be a, a possibility for a more uh, constructive uh, multilateral cooperation, transatlantic cooperation uh, as well, to do some of these things to, to help us to define the new elements of a resilient economy and to set the, the, the green standards. What is a green standard, for instance? If we can do this together with the US, we'll, be, you know, we'll set global uh, standards. We can also cooperate on, on, on some issues related to artificial intelligence, uh, cyber, uh, etc. So this will be the test if Europe can come together to, to, to formulate uh, this uh, as well. I think it's possible yeah. because we've realized how, how, how huge the, the need is. And then we need to make it sure, of course, that it's inclusive because there are so many differences within European countries and between, and they have been growing during the pandemic. So we need to help each other and support each other. And some countries will need more time to do the green transition. So we need to have this peer review and, and support. And that's where the partnership with the industry is so important important as well, to, to lead the way, to show this is how you can do it. Um, thank you. I, it, there's a kind of, uh, when you said, you know, set green standards with the US, feels like a contradiction in terms at the moment, given Mr. Trump's comments uh, on, the, on the agenda. But I know there are many, many players within the US who are much more up for uh, the, this agenda than uh, the current administration over there would suggest. Uh, but thank you for that. Um, I want to bring back Frank, if I may. Frank. Um, you are, you know, the chair of the European Roundtable in Industry. Um, the people, you know, you're, you're representing and working with will be collaborating with the gov you know, EU uh, around crafting this new thing. We heard what, how it should behave to a certain extent, what it should be. What does competitiveness look like in the future from your perspective? Well, I think we need to do two things. Uh, let me also, by the way, say on transatlantic, uh, we're closely working together with the US Business Roundtable um to make sure in an ideal world uh, you would have an alliance between the us uk europe maybe india to modernize also the, the trade rules eh? but we need to do two things the first one is to make sure that the digital deal mm. is at the same level of ambition uh, uh political will as the as the green deal eh? if you look for example to the rollout of 5g it is terrible europe is yes. horribly behind and 5G is not about, let's say, faster Netflix. It's also not the reason why we have Corona. 5G is important because it's a software for the, it's an infrastructure for the plants, for the factories, for the jobs of the future. So that's one. Accelerate the digital deal, much, much, much more emphasis. Secondly, let's measure. Uh, as the European Roundtable for Industry, we have developed 25 K, 28 KPIs in four fields. We're sharing it actively with the European Commission. We are launching it uh, the coming coming weeks. But if we don't measure the progress, you know, then it's then it's then it's then it doesn't keep that momentum. Uh, uh, and and you know, indicators like you know how we're doing in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, uh, an output performance, or in internal processes, also you know, circular material use, the ease of doing business, or the greenhouse gas emissions. 
future orientation, uh, R&D investments, or 5G adoption rate, or in global relationships, FDI inflows, international students. So if we measure on these four fields mm -hmm. with key performance indicators, how competitive Europe is, I'm sure we continue to create, let's say, the economic value, which shows the importance of our overall values. Thank you so much. Uh, Frank, thank you very much. And we look forward to um, obviously uh, seeing how this pans out and you, in, in the next few months before the Commission finally rolls out its approach, which obviously I think perhaps is going to be much more evolving than a, an end deal. But your yeah, notion the good, of a the good news, if, if I may add, the good yeah. news is that uh, <coughs> uh, President von der Leyen has announced eh, in her State of the Union that she will renew the industry strategy, the one which was published in March actually mm -hmm. didn't even contain the word, the word resilience, was not there. So yes, the thinking is ongoing and let's use the trend transitions uh, skills uh, to, to, again, to strengthen competitiveness, but also put it into action and let's measure. Thank you. I want to uh, conclude with, uh, let's say, a comment from um, Agnes. Agnes, a lot of what happens on the industrial strategy relies on the behavior of individual members uh, um, and uh, you know member states, um, I'm not sure. Are you still with us, Agnes? Probably not. So I've called away from something very important. Perhaps someone wants to respond to this in the sense that um, when we think about the the role of member states in this particular trajectory, actually any industrial strategy worth its salt will rely on the big players uh, within the member states. And I'm not sure anyone has a clue about how that might pan, it, you know, pan out as we move forward um, in, in, in the next few months. But if anyone has a view, uh, please do scribe it uh, on, on this, the chat function. Um, it, we now come to an end. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope you found this thought provoking and stimulating. And um, we haven't solved the problem, obviously, and we can't, but I think we've got specific uh, elements that have been set out by many of you in this, in this uh, forum about the kind of characteristics uh, 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 the emerging and future uh, industrial strategy should, should be about. Um, and I think the fact that we, there are some lessons here that, uh, that many of you uh, point to in terms of how we did the battery alliance, look at the potential of the biorevolution, let's think about a different characteristic and underpinning for industrial strategy that is both inclusive, fair, competitive, but most importantly, saves people and planet. Thank you all very much. Continue to uh, engage with us on the um, State of Europe uh, uh, platform um, that you're engaging right now. Our next session, please do join us if you have the time um, and, and the uh, opportunity, is to join the discussion about beyond hard security towards a broader concept of strategic autonomy. So same kind of some of those issues that we've been talking about today will be aired in a different context. And then later on, we'll again be discussing matters of industry and biodiversity in, in the revolution that's taking place. Thank you all very much. And I look forward to seeing you again. Take care, mind your distance and be safe. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>